As you're seated, if we can ask a favor, if there's any empty seats nearby, you move over so they're by the aisle, so if somebody comes in late, they can find a place, but you may be seated. We want to welcome you to Child and Angelina's wedding. It's been a long time coming, about two weeks, I think, and... Uh, <laughs> But we praise God it's all come together, and uh, it's been for a good reason. But before we start the ceremony, I wanted to share some thoughts with you. I've had a chance to sit down with them and counsel them, and they're going to be doing some follow-up counseling after they're married as well. And I don't know how much they're going to listen to me today, but I've got some thoughts to share with them and to share with you as well. As I thought about what I could tell them, I thought about, well, who are they? And there's a lot of things I know about Jael because he's grown up here in our church, and there's many things I've learned about Angelina since she's been coming and, and became a Christian and known the Lord and just watching her grow in the Lord. But one thing they both have in common is they're both nurses. And so I thought I'd tie that in a little bit to marriage. You know, being a nurse is going to be good for being married too because nurses have a lot of patience, and you need a lot of patience in marriage, okay? The Bible says in Colossians chapter 1, verses 10 and 11, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. If you have ever prayed for patience, and the Bible tells us in James chapter 1, when we go through trials in our life, it says, Let patience have her perfect work that he might be perfect, entire, wanting nothing. And if you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that give it to all men liberally, and abradeth not, it should be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavers like the wave of the sea, driven with the wind to toss. And if you pray for patience, often what God does is give you a trial so you can learn patience. And if you're going to learn patience, it's going to be a marriage, because you have to learn to be patient with one another. There's two words that says, with all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. The first word, patience, it means cheerful, hopeful endurance. And that's really what patience is. It's having a cheerful, and we'll talk about that in a moment, but a hopeful endurance. 1 Corinthians 13, 7, it says, Love beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. You need to believe the best in one another. And when those times come that you do fail each other, then you hope for better next time. And when that fails, then you have to endure all things believing that God is going to bring you through those trials and tribulations. But you do it with patience. You do it with that, that cheerful, hopeful endurance. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 2, 3, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And you're going to have to endure some things when you're married because you'll find you'll have conflicts and problems. The other word is the word long-suffering. And long-suffering is a unique word in the Bible. It comes from two Greek words, macrothumia. Macro means big or long, and thumia means to burn. And so long-suffering means to burn long. And what that means, I think there's two illustrations that really help you to understand that. One is like in the old-time movies, and you're not old enough to remember this, but in the old-time movies, the, 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 hero, the heroine would be kidnapped by the villain, and the villain would tie up the heroine and put her in a cave with a stick of dynamite with a fuse about this long. And then the whole movie was the hero climbing mountains and crossing oceans and fighting off the enemy, uh, trying to get to the heroine to save her. And they keep flashing back to that stick of dynamite, and it keeps burning and burning and burning. It seems like it takes forever to burn. And then right when the hero gets there, he unties her, takes her out of the cave, and it blows up. And, and that's what long-suffering is. It's having a long fuse, not a short fuse. It's willing to keep that fuse burning, to not let it die out. But I think the other illustration here is like those trick birthday candles when you were young. You know, the ones where you blow them out and they light back up. You blow them out and you light back up. Inside of you, there's a fire of love for Angelina. Inside of you, there's a fire of love for Jael. And what's going to happen is sometimes Jael's going to walk up to you and do something that's going to be like he went and blew that fire out. And at that point, you have a choice to make. You can let her action control your feelings or you can choose to let the Holy Spirit of God in love light that flame right back up again. Don't let it go out. Be long-suffering. Keep that flame burning no matter what she does, no matter what he does, to show patience and endurance, long-suffering. But the other thing about nurses is not only do they have a lot of patience, but you have to give out medicine. It's one of the big jobs of a nurse is making sure the patients get the medicine that they need and get the right medicine. In Proverbs 17, it says, A merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a bro broken spirit drieth the bones. Remember it said cheerful, hopeful endurance is patience. 
And that means you have to have a merry heart. That's the best medicine. To be able to laugh, to be able to smile, to be able to be cheerful even in those difficult times. It's choosing happiness. Paul said this in Acts chapter 26, verse 2, when he was a prisoner, when he was on trial for his life, and he had been beaten, he looked at the king and said, I think myself happy. He made a choice. His circumstances were not good, but he chose to be happy anyway, to have his happiness not based upon his circumstances. And that's what Bible joy is. The, the Bible tells us in Nehemiah chapter 8, and verse, 10, the, verse number 10, the joy of the Lord is your strength. You might you remember we did a series of messages on the fruit of the Spirit. And the fruit I used to illustrate joy was the fruit of a lemon. Because when I put lemon and joy together, I think of lemon joy dishwashing soap. And that is the best illustration of Bible joy. Happiness is no dirty dishes. But joy is what you add to the dishes to make them easier to clean. And joy is what you're going to add to your problems. Happiness is we got no problems. But that's not life. Life brings problems. And joy is what you add to the situation to make the problems easier to deal with. Psalm 1611 says, Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. And so find that joy of the Lord in every situation. Now, I will advise you, Gile, one of the things you want to do is wash the dishes every now and then. Okay? Uh, my wife has a plaque that says, No man ever got shot while washing dishes. And there's a lot of truth to that. And so you can do some of those chores around the house, and you can help out. 2 Corinthians 8, 2 says how that in great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abound in the riches of liberality. Joy is getting in there and helping out whenever there's a problem, whenever there's a need. It's just doing my part to make it easier to deal with that situation. Don't leave it to her alone, but you get in there and help out. Angelina, when you want to cry, that's when you need joy. Bible says in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10, Then said he unto them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink the sweet, and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our Lord. Neither be you sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. A lot of times when people are sorry and feeling sorry for themselves, what do they do? They go eat dessert, because that always makes you feel better. Well, you know, there's an old saying. It's not from the Bible. I think Mary Poppins said it. A spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. And when there's a problem... The joy makes it easier to deal with that problem. And so learn to have the joy of the Lord. That's the best medicine that you can give in patience to one another. But nurses also care. I think that's one of the things I always think of when I think of nurses. Uh, it doesn't always seem like the doctors care. I know they do. It doesn't always seem like the, the people at the desk care. But every time I've ever been in the hospital, it's the nurses who care for me. They're the ones that show the greatest care. Somebody said that nurses have compassion compassionate assistance through resourceful experience. I think there's a lot of truth to that. Jude one twenty two says this, and if some have compassion, make it a difference. So have compassion. Show compassion one to another. Have caring for one another. You can get through anything if you believe she cares for you. And you can get through anything if you believe that he cares for you. And so show that care and that compassion. I know you do it as nurses. And you can do it as husband and wife as well. We're going to say some vows in just a moment. And those vows, it says, in sickness and in health. In James chapter 5, verses 13 through 15, it says, Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him. Anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. And so in sickness and health, you've got to be willing to take care of her, whatever is going on in her life. You've got to be willing to take care of him, whatever is going on in his life. As a nurse, you have to take care of people in pretty bad situations. You have to show that compassion and that care, even when they're throwing up, even when they're whining and crying, even when they're in pain, you've got to show compassion. And that's exactly what you need to do in your marriage as well, is have compassion, making a difference in each other's life, even in those difficult times. We're also going to say the words for better or for worse. Things are going to get, get better. There's a lot of blessings about being married. In 3 John 1 verse 2, it says, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. I've been praying for you. I'm praying that God will bless you guys physically, spiritually, emotionally, in every way. And I know that God's going to bless you. 
And in those blessing times, that's a good time to be married. But in worse as well. You're going to see Angelina at her worst. You're going to see Gile at his worst. You're going to see him when he wakes up in the morning. Not very pretty. Ask his dad and mom. You're going to see her when she's tired and hungry. That's not always nice to see. You're going to see him when he's sick and throwing up. You're going to see her when you don't get your way. Those are the worst times, but you still need to love her. And you need to love her unconditionally. The love the Bible talks about is a love that gives. In John 3, 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And that's the kind of love that God wants you to give each other, a sacrificial servant love, giving of yourself to the other person without expecting anything in return. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is Romans 5, 8. But God commendeth or showed his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Here's a reason why you fell in love with Angelina. She's a beautiful young lady. She's talented. She's smart. There's a reason why you fell in love with Gile. I'm still trying to figure it out, but we'll figure it out at some point. But you know what? There's no reason for God to love me. None at all. And yet he chose to love me when I was unlovable, when I was a sinner. And I'm so thankful for that love. And that's the pattern. That's the picture he wants to use in your life. You know that marriage is a visual picture of the love of Christ? In Ephesians chapter 5, verses 31 to 32, it says, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and they shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. And then he says, This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. You are giving a visual picture to your guests today of Jesus Christ and his love for you, how he sacrificed himself, how he gave of himself in love for you. And all you had to do was do exactly what you're going to do today, and that's say, I do to him. You see, Gile, how much did you pay her to marry you? Nothing. Nothing? Not a dime? No. Oh, man. How much is it going to cost him to marry you? Just his love. Just his love. You see, love is not earned, it's received. In Ephesians 2, 8, 9, it says, For by grace are you saved through faith. That not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works the same man should boast. You don't have to do anything to earn the I do today. Now, once the I do's are said, that's when the work really starts. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, it says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God had before ordained that we should walk with him. You see, now that you're married, you're going to be spending a lot of money. It didn't cost you anything to get her today, but you're going to be spending a lot of money. Now that you're married, it's going to take a lot of work. But you don't do it to get married. You do it because you're married. And salvation is exactly the same way. You don't have to work for your salvation. You just have to accept it. In just a moment, you're going to accept her love and receive her as your wife. In just a moment, you're going to accept his love and receive him as your husband. And I know that you've accepted the love of Jesus Christ and received him into your heart and your life. And I know that you've accepted the love of Jesus Christ and received him in your heart and life. See, in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, it says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth, and that's what the two of you are going to do when you say, I do. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth and believe in your heart that God has raised me to the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Romans 10, 13 says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you never say, I do, you're not married. If you never say, I do, you're not married. And if you don't say yes to Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're not saved. You have to believe in your heart. You believe she loves you, right? You believe he loves you. So that's why you're going to say I do to one another. And that's exactly what it is with Jesus Christ. It's believing that he loved you so much that he sent his only begotten son. That if you would believe in him and say I do to him, you have salvation. And so you're giving these folks a beautiful picture of that testimony today. And I thank God that you trusted Christ. And I thank God that you trusted Christ. And I thank God for the privilege today of watching you trust each other as well and to say the I do's to one another. So let's get on with that. Okay, I want to ask you both some very important questions. So step a little closer together there. Okay. Gile, will you promise to live together with your wedded wife? Why don't you go ahead and hand your flowers to your bridesmaid there. 
All right, there we go. Now you can hold hands. All right. Will you promise to live together with your wedded wife, Angelina, in harmony with God's word? Do you promise to lead her and your family as the head of your home, to love her with the sacrificial love of Christ, to cherish her and honor her in sickness and health, and forsaking all others, keep yourself only unto her so long as you both shall live? Angelina, will you promise to live together with your wedded husband, Gile, in harmony with God's word? Do you promise to reverence him as the God-appointed head of your home, to love him and to be submissively obedient to his leadership in sickness and in health, and in forsaking all others, keep yourself only unto him so long as you both shall live? I want you to repeat after me. I, Gile, I, Gile take the Angelina, take the Angelina to, be my wedded wife, to be my wedded wife, to have and to hold, to and to hold from, this forward, from this day forward, for better, for worse, for, better, for, worse, for richer, for poorer, for richer, for poorer in, sickness and in, health, in sickness and health, to lead and to love, and to, lead and to, love to cherish and to honor, honor till death, death do us part. According to God's holy word, I hereby pledge to you my faithfulness. I, Angelina, I, Angelina take thee, Gile, to, to be my wedded husband, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to reverence and to love, to submissively obey, Till death do us part. According to God's holy word, I hereby pledge to you my faithfulness. This time the couple is going to do a unity. Or oh, first we're going to do the rings. Let's see if you have a ring. What token do you have to pledge these vows? Okay. <laughs> okay. As you place the ring on Angelina's finger, repeat after me. As a pledge, As a pledge and a token of these vows, made between us, made between us with, this ring, with this ring, I thee wed, I thee wed before, Almighty God. before Almighty God. Angelina, what token do you have of your vows? A ring. Okay. No. <laughs> As you place the ring on Giles' finger, repeat after me. As a pledge, and a token of these vows made between us with this ring, I thee wed before Almighty God. This time they're going to do what's called unity sand. Here in Hawaii is an appropriate thing to do to show the blend of your lives. When sand comes together, you can't tell where one started and the other ended. And they're coming together as husband and wife, blending their lives into a brand new uh, unity. And so we're going to go ahead and do that this time. At this time, they have their own special vows they want to share with one another. 
And so we're going to let Giles go first. I love you, Angelina. And above all, I give honor to glory and God. <laughs> and above all, I give honor and glory to God for this special moment. I thank God for putting you in my life. I pray that I will love you unconditionally as Christ has loved us. I promise to provide for you in all areas of our lives, spiritually, physically, and emotionally. I promise to be faithful and loving to you and only you through all uncertainties and trials of both present and future. As we begin a new chapter in our lives, together as one, I pray that we will always put God first in everything that we do. In Genesis 2.24, it says, Therefore shall man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And in Proverbs 18.22, Whoso findeth a wife findeth a good thing, and obtaineth favor of the Lord. It is my desire to honor these scriptures and to love you as Christ has loved the church. With all of me, I make this pledge to you. Angelina. the gospel with me. For that reason in itself, I am forever grateful. Gile, from this day forth with you, I promise to keep God at the center of this marriage and always put him first. I vow to love you unconditionally, even during the times that you are hardest to love, to never stop learning how to love you and give you what you need to support you in all of your decisions, to humble myself and submit to you. I vow to give you my kindness and be your rock and friend that you can count on. I vow to listen to your voice so you can be heard, putting aside my pride, remembering that you are with me and not against me. I vow to grow with you in spirit, being equally yoked and always seeking peace through God's word. Jaya, I promise to cherish each moment I have with you and I promise to love you, to choose to love you forever here on earth. At this time, we're going to have a prayer of dedication from probably one of the most nervous men here tonight, and that's Giles' dad, Jaime. But uh, I'd like you to come. you got a microphone there. So we're going to go ahead and have him have a prayer of dedication. You guys go ahead and hold hands. Okay. Uh, let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord God, Thank you above all for your son, for the sacrifice he's done for our salvation. And thank you for seeking our hearts and drawing us to you. Father, I want to personally thank you because you've heard my prayers. I've always asked you, God, that please provide for my son, a woman who desires you above all. Because I know that if a woman desires you she can love my son beyond my expectations, oh God. So I thank you for answering my prayers. And I see that in her. I see that in Angelina, oh God. There's a true desire to love you and to draw close to you, oh God. Thank you. Heavenly Father, I do ask, I uh, have another request from you, oh Lord God. I do not ask for a happy marriage. I don't ask for blessings of finance or health. I just want you, O oh Lord God, to secure this marriage in Christ. Because I know, God, that as long as they are in Christ, everything, everything will be provided. The love, the patience, the grace, O oh Lord, that it will be sufficient for, all, for both of them. So, Father, I pray, please seal this marriage. In Jesus' name, amen. I asked Jaime if he's going to cry during the prayer, and his son's crying. <laughs> that was a great prayer, Jaime. I appreciate that. For as much as Gile and Angelina have affirmed their vows of holy wedlock and have witnessed the same before God and company 
Let me stop here for a minute. You have a responsibility by being here today. You are witnesses of their vows. And for the rest of their life, as long as you know them, make sure you, number one, pray for them. And number two, remind them, I was there when you promised to love each other. And don't let them forget that. You're witnesses, and you have a responsibility here today, too. And have given and pledged their faithfulness to each other and declared the same by giving and receiving a ring and by joining hands. I pronounce that they are husband and wife in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. You may kiss the bride. Matthew chapter 19. Before I read the final verse, I, I want to take a, a privilege here that I get to as a pastor, and I get to be the first to congratulate these two. Love you. Congratulations. Love you. Congratulations. Matthew 19, 5 and 6. This is my son, by the way. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife. And the twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore, they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God had joined together, let no man put asunder. I have the privilege of introducing to you Mr. and Mrs. Jael Kweli. May God bless this you. Please be seated for just a moment. Just before we dismiss, we're going to have a uh, reception line outside in the Welcome Center. We'd ask you to go through the right-hand door, my right hand, your left as you're facing me, but this side over here. Go through that door. You'll have a chance to greet the bride and the groom and their parents, and then they're going to have some light poo-poo, some refreshments there in the Welcome Center. It's also the photo booth where you can get a picture taken uh, to put in their album. And then there's a ukulele that they'd like to have you sign as a guest. That's their guest book. And so if you can take a moment to sign it. And we're going to have all that happening in just a little bit here. And then at 6 o'clock, we have our church service. And at that service, we're going to honor them again. So we would really love to have you come and be a part of that. Uh, I've got another uh, challenge for them as well. And it won't be a long service, but it'll just be, I think, a blessing to you as friends and family of the bride and groom. And then after the service, we're going to have a reception downstairs with some uh, full poo-poos and some, uh, some food that you can enjoy as well. And so that, the service will start at 6, and the reception will follow immediately afterwards in doing that. I'd also like to mention that as I shared the challenge with them, one of the things that is a burden on their heart is that you might not only know about their love for one another, but their love for Jesus Christ and especially his love for them. And one of the greatest gifts you could give them today is receive the gift that they have received of salvation, receiving Jesus Christ as your Savior. And if you have any questions about that, I know they would love to share that with you. We would be glad to do that. Out on the Welcome Center desk, as you go through the line, there's a stack of books called Done, D-O-N-E. Their marriage is done. They are married now. It's done. And it just took that one little, those two little words, I do, to complete that. And that's exactly, Jesus did everything already for you. He just wants you to say, I do to him. And if you'd like a copy of that book to read, to understand more about his love for you, that would be our gift to you. You're welcome to take a copy and uh, hopefully read it and understand uh, more about that gift as well. But again, we're so thankful that you came today. What we're going to do is we're going to ask that you dismiss kind of uh, by rows. We'll start with the front row and uh, work our way back. So it's one row at a time, come out. And as soon as that row is gone, the next row can go. And that'll kind of keep it somewhat orderly so it doesn't get bottlenecked here to back too badly. And uh, again, thank you so much for being with us today. Let's have a word of prayer. And then we'll let the violinist play and uh, go ahead and dismiss. Father, once again, we thank you so much for this couple for the blessing that they are to us, each one here today, family, friends, fellow church members. We love them, and we're thankful that we were here to share with them their commitment of love one to another. We pray that you would bless them in their marriage. We pray that we would be faithful to pray for them, to encourage them, 
to counsel and guide them and to hold them accountable to what they've said today. Thank you again for this day and for these folks. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.